Hi everyone and welcome to our video on inhibitors, focusing on poisons and drugs. What we're going to be doing in this final video in our little enzyme series is looking at specification reference 2.1.4F, which is the focus on the metabolic poisons and medicinal drugs with reference to how they actually affect these enzyme controlled reactions. To start off with then, let's look at these metabolic poisons. Now, when we're talking about metabolic poisons, we're referring to these toxins that exist and have an effect by inhibiting or inactivating the enzymes that are involved in a metabolic process. So what we find is there's actually a significant number of these toxins that will do this as their mode of action. Let's start with an example of cyanide. So we're going to be having a look at potassium cyanide, which is a highly toxic substance. If you read some kind of historical fiction and the like, then you're going to probably find that cyanide is the weapon of choice, particularly of the disgruntled housewife. It was actually a pretty common poison going back to the past because it wasn't actually that tricky to get hold of disturbingly and it was pretty efficient. Now, luckily these days, not such a problem. We're all thankful. What actually happens then is when your disgruntled housewife, for example, decides to put potassium cyanide in someone's food, when they ingest it, then it's going to be hydrolyzed into hydrogen cyanide. So basically, we're going to end up with hydrogen cyanide, which might sound familiar to us if we've studied history. That hydrogen cyanide is then going to dissociate, so it's going to split to form hydrogen ions, H+, and cyanide ions, Cn-. Now, it's those cyanide ions that are the problem because they will bind irreversibly to this enzyme, cytochrome C oxidase. This is going to be problematic in terms of respiration, aerobic respiration to be specific because cytochrome C oxidase is one of the enzymes involved in delivering electrons to oxygen during the electron transport chain in respiration. So if we've actually basically prevented our cytochrome C oxidase from carrying out this electron delivery, then we've shut down the electron transport chain of aerobic respiration. If we're not able to move the electrons, we're not going to be able to generate the ATP that we need as the end of our aerobic respiration process. And that means we won't have enough ATP to then be able to run all those other metabolic processes. So bad news all round. The next thing to consider is a more natural kind of poison really, which is good old venom. Now venom is gonna come from creatures like our snakes and the one we're going to look at is this happy little chappy at the bottom, the green mamba. Now, the green mamba actually contains a venom which has the inhibitor of acetylcholinesterase in it. The acetylcholinesterase is the enzyme that's going to break down acetylcholine where we have those neuromuscular synapses. If we've got this green mamba venom in our body, what's going to happen is it's going to inhibit our acetylcholinesterase. The acetylcholine will therefore stay bound to the receptors on the muscle membrane and the muscle will remain in that state of contraction. So we're pretty much paralyzing that muscle. Depending on which muscle is paralyzed determines the effect. If we're talking about the ones involved in breathing, then we have quite a significant problem because if we've paralyzed the muscles involved in breathing, you're not going to be able to carry out the process and you're basically going to suffocate all because of this little green mamba introducing an inhibitor to one enzyme. We then need to consider some medicinal drugs and how we could use this idea of inhibiting enzymes to potentially treat certain conditions. The first one, which is quite an old drug really these days, is aspirin. Now, 
aspirin actually contains this stuff called salicylic acid. And the salicylic acid is going to bind to the enzymes that we require to form this stuff called prostaglandins. Now, prostaglandins are all involved in creating sensitivity to pain and swelling. So if we prevent the formation of those prostaglandins, the nerve cells are not going to become sensitive to the pain. We're going to reduce swelling in that region and therefore treat an issue. So what we're actually doing here is by having that knowledge about how we can inhibit these enzymes needed to form prostaglandins, we can then create an additional drug which is going to then stop the pain and the swelling. So the last example we're going to look at then is the purple foxglove. You can see them in the bottom corner there. These are pretty common flowers in the UK in all honesty. If you look around as you're wandering your sort of towns and villages, then you're probably going to see some of these growing in people's gardens. These actually contain a chemical called cardiac glycosides. Those are sometimes referred to as digitalis or digitoxin as well. They're all referring to the same thing, these cardiac glycosides. And the reason that these are potentially useful to us is because they are going to inhibit the sodium potassium pump. Now, I'm hoping that we've heard of our sodium potassium pump before. These are located in cell membranes of things like our cardiac muscle cells. And what we're going to find then is if we inhibit that sodium potassium pump, then we're going to have more calcium ions entering those cells. That means we're going to have greater muscle contraction and stronger heartbeats because the calcium ions are all to do with muscle contraction as we'll look at in a future video. So in terms of how we can use this potential damaging chemical in a medicinal way is that if you've got someone who has heart failure and this atrial arrhythmia, then we can actually prescribe them this digitalis and it can actually help to strengthen that heartbeat. So we can actually hopefully help some of these people with heart conditions to then improve their quality of their life through improving their heartbeat, just through something we can get from a little common garden plant at the end of the day. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the channel so you can see when there are new videos uploaded. And of course, head on over to the A-Level Biology website where you can find a range of other resources designed to help you in your study of A-Level Biology.